Um, we'll just talk. We'll, we'll start our conversation. Uh, can you tell us the first time you met Martin Luther King? How did you meet him? And what were your first impressions of meeting him? Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure that this is going to be a successful uh, interview for you because <laughs> he's just another guy, as far as I'm concerned. That's exaggerated, and I shouldn't say that. Uh, but <clears throat> when I met him, it was at Wyatt Walker's house. I don't know if you ever heard of Wyatt T. Walker. Um, because Wyatt was a minister in town in Petersburg, Virginia. And <clears throat> of course, you got a visiting a preacher in town, so you, you'd make a nice dinner. So <clears throat> we made the nice dinner at, at our pastor's house, Wyatt Walker's house. And, uh, and I helped serve the dinner, so I'm taking the trays of food around the table for, I don't know, five, six, or seven people uh, at, at White Walker's house, the, our local minister's uh, house. One reason that I know that White, Reverend Walker wanted Martin to come to Petersburg was uh, the fact that Reverend Walker was struggling against a system that declared that only white folks could use the public library and I think it was on one day a week, and it was on, uh, I think it was on Wednesdays. You can research that, but I'm pretty sure that that's the day. And I don't know, uh, but, but we couldn't seem to break that regulation by ourselves. That is Reverend Walker, Y.T. Walker, who's still around, as a matter of fact. And, uh, but he invited this preacher that he had met somewhere, Martin Luther King, invited him to come and do some sermons at his church, at Reverend Walker's uh, church. So um, when I remember being being there to help serve the dinner, so there's like six or seven people walking around the table with trays of food, and I don't know who the other guests were, but there were other guests around the table helping to serve the food. And I think some kind of connection happened. And we started to we started to have some ongoing interaction with this preacher, Martin Luther King. They became fast friends and they wanted an education director. And I had a master's degree from education, uh, in education from uh, Boston University. And uh, when I, and I think I was hankering to leave Petersburg, Virginia. So when Reverend Walker asked me to come because he wanted to run those kinds of classes uh, at his church, I, I, was, um, I told my husband I'd see you in a few days. But I'm, I, I have to try not to cry because I didn't ever come back. <laughs> um, and as you got to know Dr. King, did you feel like he, if he weren't, did he always want to be a preacher? Was he somebody that, that uh, wanted to be a preacher from a young age because of his father? And I'm saying, is there any other job he might have done? Yeah, Martin was a natural born uh, preacher. And, uh, and I say that because I became very close, very much in the inner circle, uh, at, ultimately at Martin's church. So, but that's kind of ahead of the story here. And, and I knew that I was impressed by what this uh, preacher, this little preacher, as my sister would say, uh, what he, how he could um, put a sermon together if you wake him up probably in the middle of the night, I don't know. Your sister called him a little preacher. Was he physically, was... He was no taller than I was. You can look at photographs and see that. If you haven't seen, uh, see, I could probably send you pictures of Martin standing in a group, and he's the shortest one there, but, uh, but, but he was the most powerful one there, too. Powerful speaker. And not only was he a powerful speaker, he was very um, effective uh, as a speaker. Um, Martin could um, 
I, he could hold an audience in the palm of his hand and making sense. When, can you talk about when he would give a speech? Uh, he's famous for his his language and also his big words, like his intellectual speeches. How did that land with uh, with the audience? Did he did he come across? How did he yeah. come across? I have never thought of Martin of uh, I neither Wyatt <laughs> nor Martin. Uh, making big speeches because he could he could too easily hold an audience in the palm of his hand. We were just drawn to him. That's that's what I can say about it. We were drawn to Martin Luther King because of his uh, artistry, the way he could speak, um, and yeah, that's it. What else? I don't know. Is there to say except that he was great right. and people responded to it. Can you talk about being on the road with Martin Luther King, the kind of family that would, any uh, anecdotes, any stories about being on the road as this inner circle, traveling the world and traveling the country? Any, yeah. any great stories that come to mind? Well, they had small children. And, uh, you know, Dexter and Yolanda, and they had to, um, somebody had to be home with those small, small children. And so Coretta was home with the children. And, and Martin was the one that was uh, spreading the, the gospel. She was, Coretta wasn't about to try to stop her husband from doing what he obviously felt born to do. And um, I don't know anything. I never heard anything about uh, his, her trying to stop him from doing what he was just natural at and that is uh, speaking, sermonizing. He was a poet. You could wake Martin up and, right. and from a nap, and he could do a sermon. On the road, I mean, when you're traveling to another town, like what, as a man, what would he eat? Uh, what would you, what would you eat? What, any, any kind of moments, you, any moments of that life that you remember fondly about traveling with Dr. King? Um, to, you know, is there anything that really sticks out that you remember in See, your life? See, I know people think someone who achieves that degree of fame, because uh, I, I think maybe I did that too for a while. We think of such a person as being extraordinary, and uh, he could, <laughs> the, the rest of you could close your ears. In your neighborhood, did they ever serve pig feet? <laughs> You could, you could see Martin eating one. There's a picture somewhere, but it probably got thrown away. But uh, he loved the, he loved those pork um, trays, and which I thought sometimes were disgusting. I could eat a little bit of it, but uh, but but he loved to just be down home with the folks. That's that's what my sister's language, and but it was always. Um, well, I'll give you an example of what I'm thinking about, the naturalness of this guy, Martin. Well, we would walk from the SCLC office down the street from our office, and we would pass the juke joints. Is that a language you could? And guys in there playing pool, probably got no jobs. And, uh, and Martin would go in there and play with them. And... I remember saying to him, you will do it the church in 20 minutes. I mean, like his mother. <laughs> um, and, and I had to say, we, we got to get there. When Martin would get there uh, from the pool hall to the church, he just, he was good at it too. When he would get to the church, he would take five or 10 minutes and go in the back and sit for a few minutes. And when he come out, came, would come out, he was on fire with the gospel. <laughs> he was a natural preacher, Martin was a natural preacher. And, uh, and he didn't mind stopping on the, on the street where the pool shops were. I don't know if y'all call them pool shops, but um, he didn't mind stopping hanging out with those people in, in that neighborhood. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Why, why would he not stop with them? He never gave up his humanity, his naturalness, 
and uh, so and and he would like to see if he could beat some of those guys, and 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 I, one of us would have to get Martin away from the pool table, to uh, you, you do it the church in ten minutes, you know, and when he got to the church, you would think he'd been studying all night. Uh, can you talk about Stokely Carmichael and his relationship with Martin Luther King? I can't talk about Stokely Carmichael because there was not, no such thing as a relationship. There was uh, such a thing as, um, um, I'm trying to think of the right word. I, don't, I think you can count on one hand the time that they were in the same space uh, together. Uh, same thing with uh, two or three other guys who were of that ilk and because uh, uh, they were going to have nothing to do with nonviolence and uh, and Martin would laugh and play with them and but that was also Martin's way of getting to know them and he could kind of sneak up on them and uh, for example one guy was going to go beat up a white guy or an African-American guy gonna be, and he said uh, let's see yesterday you told me what kind of community is that you say you want Oh, and you're gonna get it by beating up the blonde guy, <laughs> and that, and it was over. It was. I mean, he he had that kind of humor. But because people were learning, people were learning, and they needed to learn. <laughs> they needed, and I was. A, I had fifty people sometimes in a workshop discussing nonviolence, and we would off very often. Uh, I get Martin to come over. And, and close out a five-day training workshop with the focus on nonviolence. And I'll never forget, um, as a matter of fact, if you've seen my, the book I did, if your back's not bad, that, that's what Martin said as he finished talking to these 50 or 60 people, um, if your back's not bent. Nobody can ride your back if your back's not bent. And when he said that, I mean, I, I made a big speech out of that. What does he mean by back being bent? Can you talk about how nonviolence is misunderstood today? I don't think it's misunderstood. I don't think anybody is teaching it. And nobody's, who's teaching it? And to, talk, to teach uh, nonviolence, we need to go into some depth and talk about what Mahatma Gandhi did in India. We need to talk about what anybody we can find in, in this country, we can talk about Martin. We can talk about what they did and how that brought about a more peaceful community rather than go beat up some white guy because he believed in segregation. Um, I was gonna ask you about what it was like to be, uh, about women in the movement. Um, what was it like to be a woman in a movement uh, run by men? Um, and you know, in terms of feminism, do you think that how was Martin, what was Martin's attitude? Yeah, I, I don't even deal with that junk. That when I say that junk, it was up in the Delta, Mississippi, that Fannie Lou Hamer was up there fighting for the right of black folk to go into public places, use a public restroom. We were all over Fannie Lou Hamer. It was a Rosa Parks who decided she was not going to move to the back of the bus. I don't let people get away with saying anything like that because it's not true. When Rosa Parks would not move to the back of the bus to give a white guy her seat up front, uh, <coughs> it didn't have anything to do with, with, with black white. It had to do with this woman who said, I'm not going to the back of that bus. Can, uh, going back to uh, Martin, and, and when he's having a meeting of all of his staff, his inner circle, uh, Andy Young and, and Jesse Jackson, all the people around, all the inner and outer circles, what was his leadership style? What was Martin Luther King's leadership style? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I chuckled because <laughs> people were so, um, I want to use the word autonomous, uh, but I don't believe, um, I don't believe anybody would say we, that it was a team of individualists, because uh, we were a team. We were a team, and, and when Martin spoke, we shut up and listened. He it was something about the way Martin, it, Martin could sit there for half an hour, an hour, listen to us argue, 
about, no, let's go here, let's go there, let's teach this, let's do whatever. And he would, he would listen to us argue and debate something. And when it was time to act, I remember seeing Martin just stand up and go, and guess what we did? We went right behind him because there was something about the way he said and did what he did. You know, we, we knew we had the right man, the right leader, with the right spirit. What Martin had didn't, was not given and taken like a match or something. Martin could be very quiet and have all the power in the room. Uh, I want to talk about Vietnam and the Riverside Church speech and his how, how that must have been difficult for Martin to to come out against the Vietnam War. Were you part I, of those discussions? I, I, I'm not going to be an expert on that, but I know he, what I do know is that Martin killing each other is not going to solve the problem. And so maybe I do, <laughs> Martin could talk about, he could describe what's gonna happen once you kill, and he could talk about family members and what have you created. He, would, he could teach a lot by asking questions. And when he would ask the questions, a sudden quiet would come over the room. And because he wanted to make people think about what they wanted. And if you want, what was it in the earlier, this morning session? What was it you said you wanted? Yeah. So if you go kill her son, what you think they're going to do to your son? So there's not much to talk about there. It's, it's about re, um, changing the way we interpret violence versus nonviolence. And... And I think we don't see it that way. We don't look at uh, how do we change the way people think about things and uh, killing. We, we need people, somebody out there teaching right now. Uh, what, what, what are you going to do? So if you kill that woman, son, what you think is going to happen to your son? If you, that, that's a flippant way of putting it. I mean, I wouldn't be so... I, I would probably uh, introduce it with some poetry and always some singing. I'm going to do what the Spirit says do. <laughs> I'm going to do what the Spirit says do. What the Spirit says do, I'm going to do, oh Lord. Do what the Spirit says do. And then we go on and say, uh, uh, you name things that you're going to do. I don't know, Martin loved to sing too. You know the Civil Rights Movement was a singing movement? You know, yeah, we loved it, we always sang. And Martin would get out in the middle of the floor and lead an auditorium full of songs. He loved to sing. And his sister, Christine, was a trained singer. But Martin didn't have to be trained, he sang from his heart. What did you sing with him? Hmm? What did you like to sing with Martin? Uh, it wasn't about singing with Martin, it was about getting a church to sing getting a, in a room full of people where he's getting ready to speak. And uh, he often would get, I love to sing, he would often get me to get that room singing before he even came out there. But when he'd come out there, he'd get them to sing one of his favorite songs or get me to sing a song. And, but he loved to sing. What kind of song, would you like to sing for us? What, what, you like, what did you sing? What, what songs when you think well, of Martin Reed? <laughs> hmm. Well, as I was just humming then, um, I'm going to do what the Spirit says do. I'm going to do what the Spirit says do. What the Spirit says do, I'm going to do, oh Lord. Do what the Spirit says do. We used to sing, um, I'll go to jail if the Spirit says 
jail. I'll jump the jail if the spirit says jail. If the spirit says jail, I'll go to jail. Oh Lord, I'll go to jail if the spirit says jail. We sang a lot of different kinds of songs. Could I ask you, what do you think that Dr. King would be doing if he hadn't been killed? What would he, where would he have gone with the movement and his work? He would have looked at, I believe, um, people who are down and out. He would be looking at, the, there's a book that's it's called The New Jim Crow. You've seen that? And I haven't read it all yet, but he would be looking at that. Why, why do we still have poor people who don't have enough to eat and can't send their kids to school and things like that? He would, he would be just on, on the nonviolent battlefield. <laughs> and I really think he would because I think it was just in his blood that he would uh, do it. He'd be speaking, uh, getting some of us to do trading workshops, and we'd be sitting around the table laying out things that we were going to now work on. I think he would keep on going. Uh in terms of your work, in terms of the younger generation today, what would you say to people today, where's the fight today? What should we be doing? No, I, I would never say it like that. I wouldn't say it was a fight. I would say, I would use a different concept um, <clears throat> because I would want a community where there was a lot of suffering, I would want them to look at what's not working right and let them, the people in that area, look what is the need here and get them. And that's what we did in the Civil Rights Movement. Fannie Lou Hamer up there in the Delta, Mississippi, Rosa Parks on that bus in Alabama. What, what is the need now? And I wouldn't lay it out, but I'd have a pocket full of answers maybe. And and I think, and th that's what I think we need to do. We is where do we go from here? And we do need to go somewhere. We have some work to do. We probably always will.